My lords, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bentham, I, I confess that every year I find it more and more difficult to maintain the standards of your presidents with the quality that is worthy of you and that you so effortlessly seem to take for granted. She rapidly became one of the most respected and popular judges, which are two qualities that don't always go hand in hand in that division in that particular division of that court. Um, on top of all that, probably the thing that we as her admirers and every single person to whom one speaks admire most about your president tonight is that she took on what was unquestionably one of the most challenging public inquiries that has ever been held in this country and dealt with it with the kind of efficiency and humanity which those of us who knew her and know her take for granted but which quite literally reduced the rest of the people who saw it either to speechless admiration or on many occasions to tears it is a huge pleasure and a personal privilege to me to welcome heather as your president tonight Thank you, Evan. I'm disappointed that Jeremy Bentham cannot be with us tonight. I should have liked to know how he would have received the 2012 president of the society founded in his name. He was a supporter of women's rights, and therefore our relationship should have started well. However, I'm proud to call myself a common lawyer and, of course, a judge. And I fear that once he became aware of that, our relationship would have deteriorated fast. Jeremy Bentham, as you know, was no fan of judges. For him, judges and lawyers were conspirators in a criminal plot to secure fat fees with which to line their deep pockets. Over the centuries, he's not been alone in his low opinion of lawyers, and one might therefore forgive him for this particular lapse in judgment and overgeneralization. However, I cannot forgive him for his failure to appreciate the importance of judicial independence. For a man who believed in the rights of individuals, I would ask him, were he released from his cabinet, who better than judges who have taken an oath to try cases without fear or favor, to maintain the rule of law and uphold the rights of individuals? If so, how can they perform that function unless free of inappropriate constraints? Bentham's antipathy to judicial independence was recently summarized by Professor Galligan of Oxford University, who said this, Jeremy Bentham was opposed to judicial independence because it made judges unaccountable and allowed them to do what they like. He thought they should be subject to the rigorous scrutiny of public opinion. In the light of this, I think we can safely say that Bentham would have vigorously dissented from Anthony Kennedy, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court's view that judicial independence is not conferred so judges can do as they please. Judicial independence is conferred so judges can do as they must. Bentham would no doubt have listened, arched an eyebrow, and replied in the style of Mandy Rice Davis, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Bentham believed that an independent judiciary is one which, in truth, is, quotes, dependent on its own passions and caprice, close quotes. Judicial independence began in this country hand in hand with the common law, and there lay the problem as far as Bentham was concerned. Common law, judge-made law, was, in his view, plain wrong. In Adrian Vermeule's words, the flaw in the common law was that it is a system through which precedent trumped the constitutional views of legislatures and executive officials if necessary. It may be that a member of my inn, the Inner Temple, was partly responsible for his jaundiced opinion of judge-made law. In 1610, 
Sir Edward Cook, the man who did so much to give the common law its firm foundation, found in favour of Dr Bonham. Dr Bonham had taken on what I must now call the frontline regulators of his day, the then equivalent of the GMC. Despite Acts of Parliament and a Royal Charter apparently giving the frontline regulators the right to act as prosecutor, judge and jury and giving them the power to imprison, Cook ruled robustly that in many cases the common law will control Acts of Parliament and sometimes adjudge them to be utterly void for when an Act of Parliament is against common right and reason or repugnant or impossible to be performed the common law will control it and adjudge such an act to be void. Some statutes are made against law and right, which those who made them perceiving would not put them in execution. Had that decision stood alone, one might have understood how the perception could have arisen that the judiciary had the power of the legislature, but none of the accountability. However, it didn't stand alone. And Jeremy Bentham's mistake, if I may respectfully say so, was a failure to acknowledge the reality of the post-1689 constitutional settlement. The judiciary may well develop the common law through precedent, but the common law yields to statute, to the will of Parliament. Precedent does not trump the views of Parliament. It may trump the views of members of the executive, but that is an entirely different matter. When the courts set aside the views of the executive or hold the executive to account, they do so because they are fulfilling their constitutional role. They are ensuring that the executive, which is required to act within the law, does so. Bentham's problem here was perhaps an unthinking conflation of parliament and the executive. This is surprising given that the separation of powers was at the heart of his legal philosophy. He argued that our entire constitutional and legal arrangements had to be recast. He wanted codification of the law, clear separation of powers, and open scrutiny of the institutions of governance, which, we, which were to be subject to full democratic control. Substitute the word transparent for open, and he might have been a press officer for a modern politician. He believed this openness and accountability were to be achieved by ensuring that the judiciary carried out their role in the full gaze of public scrutiny. He would undoubtedly have favoured the broadcasting of court proceedings, rubbing his hands with glee at the prospect, as he would have seen it, of lawyers and judges grandstanding and showing their colours in their true light. Justice, of course, must be open. Bentham was one of the first to recognise that fact. He argued the judiciary should operate under the watchful eye of what he called the public opinion tribunal. Through such openness and scrutiny, all members of society could, he thought, be educated properly to understand the public interest. Further, he believed that the public opinion tribunal so educated could then exercise their sovereign power through the electoral process. The people were his Caesar. The judiciary, like the other branches of the state, should be subject to Caesar's will. To my ear, that sounds distressingly like a call for the election of judges, as in some parts of the United States system. For those who find that prospect alluring, I cannot resist the temptation to rehearse the details of a case cited by a colleague in another lecture, and with which I am sure many of you are familiar, namely Caperton and Massey. To my mind, it puts paid once and for all to any suggestion that judges should be elected, if that is what Bentham had in mind. Caperton and Massey were business rivals. Caperton sued Massey and won a 15 million verdict from the jury. Massey's chief executive officer spent three million pounds supporting the campaign of Brent Benjamin, an attorney, for a seat on the West Virginia Court of Appeals to which he knew the appeal was heading. After winning election to the court, Justice Benjamin 
refused to recuse himself from hearing the appeal. He cast the deciding vote in the court's 3-2 decision in Massey's favour. The dissenting minority found the majority's reasoning incomprehensible. Somehow, Caperton won a rehearing. Benjamin was by now Chief Justice. He selected the judges to hear the appeal. Caperton lost again. The case found its way to the Supreme Court in Washington. Caperton did win, but on grounds that there was an appearance of lack of imp impartiality, I should say so, <laughs> but the victory was only five to four. Some very distinguished jurists were in the dissenting minority, including Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia. It is instructive to see how Associate Justice Scalia, another bencher of my inn, put it. Blankenship, the Chief Executive Officer, has made large expenditures in connection with several previous West Virginia elections, which undercuts any notion that his involvement in this election was intended to influence the outcome of particular pending litigation. <laughs> it is also far from clear that Blankenship's expenditures affected the outcome of this election. Justice Benjamin just might have won because the voters of West Virginia thought that he would be a better judge than his opponent. Unlike the majority, I cannot say with any degree of certainty that Blankenship chose the judge in his own cause. I would give the voters of West Virginia more credit than that. I know little about the voters of West Virginia, but I confess I find this reasoning surprising. The perception that the vote of one judge on the court had been bought was all too obvious. Certainty that a litigant had chosen the judge in his cause was surely not required. To my mind, this is a modern and glaring example of why a system of electing judges is plain wrong. First, there is the obvious reason that an election today inevitably involves a campaign. A campaign requires funding, and the person or people providing the funds may appear to acquire by their financial support inappropriate influence over the court. Further, security of judicial tenure is the primary means through which a society committed to the rule of law ensures that an individual, that at an individual and consequently institutional level, the judiciary as a body is insulated from extraneous influences. It is a necessary precondition for a judge to adjudicate without fear or favour, to adjudicate solely on the facts established by the parties and according to the applicable law. Rendering judicial office subject to removal or the threat of removal by an electorate undermines the rule of law and an effective democracy. It does so because it places pressure on a judge to have in mind the electorate's views or perceived views when deciding a case rather than the facts and the law. There lies the path to arbitrary justice. Bentham never grappled with the fact that his theory would place all three branches of the state at the mercy of the opinion of the moment, or of the opinion of the majority of the moment. His faith in the view that if our institutions were reformed as he wanted, Caesar would be better informed and would therefore never lapse into the opinion of the moment and would only ever be measured and enlightened was in my view at best naive and at worst foolish. A further criticism of Bentham's approach is that it contains a fallacy. It conflates independence with unaccountability. The two are not necessarily the same. Independence does not imply, require or necessarily justify the latter. The judiciary can be independent of the other branches of the state without being unaccountable. As is well known, judges are accountable in a number of ways. We are accountable in respect of our judicial decisions through proceedings being held in open court. We must give reasons for our decisions. We are accountable through the appellate process and we are accountable in cases of misconduct. 
in respect to the development and interpretation of the law, we are accountable to Parliament in the sense that we bow to Parliament, which can correct those developments through legislation. It is the separation of powers in action. The institutional independence of the judiciary from the executive and the legislative branches is an aspect of the separation of powers, which, as I understand it, was a constitutional principle dear to Bentham's heart. Traditionally, it was taken to mean the separation of the executive, the legislature, and the legal system, leaving the judiciary to act according to the law and uninfluenced by politicians or the executive. However, the rise in multinational corporations, some of whom have incomes higher than the GDPs of small countries, and the rise in the power of the media, suggest it may be necessary to rethink the categories of potential influence upon the judiciary. Here, Bentham might agree. He understood the possibility of improper influence being brought to bear upon the judiciary as a whole and upon individual judges. In the defence of liberty, he discussed maintenance and champerty, which, as we know, prohibited strangers to litigation financially supporting legal proceedings and from doing so for a profit. In the course of his critique, he conjured up this image of our medieval law courts. It was, he said, a mischief in those times that a man would buy a weak claim in hopes that power might convert it into a strong one and that the sword of a baron stalking into court with a rabble of retainers at his heels might strike terror into the eyes of a judge upon the bench. The, the swaggering barons of medieval times used brute force to strike terror into the heart of the quivering judge. The barons of today may not be so unsubtle, but their influence could be no less powerful. It seems from the following quote that whatever else Bentham thought about judges, he thought the judges of his day robust enough to withstand any onslaught from any baron. He observed, who cares an English judge for the swords of a hundred barons, neither fearing nor hoping, <coughs> hating nor loving. The judge of our days is ready with equal phlegm to administer upon all occasions that system, whatever it may be, of justice or injustice, which the law has put into his hands. I am confident that our 21st judges in the United Kingdom have sufficient phlegm to resist external threats, inducements or influences. However, will that always be the case? We are all acutely conscious of the vast increase in legislation and of controversial legislation. As the moral authority of other institutions declines, there is a greater and greater recourse to the law as the solution to all problems. More is demanded of the law, more is demanded of the judges. The judges are thrust into the limelight in a way which would have been unheard of years ago and in a way of which Bentham might have approved. In recent years, the judiciary in this country has come under increasing pressure from both the press and the politicians and Bentham's wind of public opinion. Criticism is often widespread and ill-informed. Decisions of the courts unpopular with the press or government ministers have led some to comment in personal terms about the judges responsible. At least one is reported as issuing a threat. My examples are all relatively modern and I could have cited one from the press cuttings this very week. The first example I wish to consider is that of Congreve and the Home Office, which dates back to the 1970s and the days of the wonderful Lord Denning. It was a case about TV licence fees. For those with long memories, before 1975, the TV licence was £12 a year. On the 29th of January 1975, the Home Secretary made an order under the Wireless Telegraphy Act 1949, raising the licence fee to £18 a year. A number of cute people took advantage of the fact that they were forewarned of the impending increase. Shortly before the increase came into effect on the 1st of April, they obtained new licences, despite the fact their old licences had not expired. 
As Lord Denning put it, and I'll resist the temptation to lapse into my native Hampshire accent, the Home Office was furious. It wrote to the offenders threatening to revoke their licences unless they paid an extra six pounds. Mr Congreve, one of the £12 licence fee holders, issued proceedings seeking a declaration that the Home Office could not lawfully revoke his licence. He lost at first instance, but not before Lord Denning. They allowed his appeal and declared the pro proposed revocation of his licence unlawful. But what is important about the case is this. In the course of the appeal, leading counsel for the Home Office made what was a remarkable submission. Lord Denning summarised it as follows. In the course of his submissions, Mr Parker said at one point, and I made a note of it at the time, <laughs> that if the court interferes in this case, it would not be long before the powers of the court would be called in question. We trust, Lord Denning added, that this was not said seriously, but only as a piece of advocate's licence. My second example moves closer to the present. You will no doubt remember the furore over the so-called super-injunctions and hyper-injunctions. During the furore, the Daily Mail attributed to an MP the view that judges should be summoned to Parliament, made subject to Parliament's contempt powers and packed off to the Tower. The headline was worded as follows. Let's threaten them with prison. MP goes to war with judges who hand out gagging orders. I should say that it's far from clear that that's what the MP said or meant. But when I take you to my third example across the Atlantic, then it may be he did. In America, this theme of imprisoning the judges has been explored further. Arthur Hellman's critique of the threats in the United States to judicial independence has commented on an initiative in the state of South Dakota. The initiative came under the banner Jail for Judges. In November 2006, the initiative ensured a proposed constitutional amendment was placed on a state ballot paper. The proposal sought to, quote, cut back substantially judicial immunity. It would have created an elaborate system of special grand juries that would investigate, indict, and initiate criminal prosecution of wayward judges. The rationale was explained in this way. The proponents of the Jail for Judges initiative have made no secret about what they're trying to do. They want to intimidate the judges. They have proudly proclaimed that by wearing their jail t-shirts, they send that intimidation factor flowing through the judicial system. There is no ambiguity as to their goal. An independent judiciary is exactly what they're trying to destroy. Thankfully, Jail for Judges only received 11% uh, of the vote. At least the disgruntled ministers in Scotland, who took exception to a recent decision of our Supreme Court, did not threaten them with prison. But they did threaten to withdraw funding. They may have spoken in haste. They may have regretted their words later. But speak them, they did. Other threats may be less obvious. Last year, the British press was full of reports of the sentences imposed by the courts on those caught up in the summer riots. Some of the sentences were tough, but as the Court of Appeal Criminal Division declared, they were tough for good reason and in accordance with settled principles. Yet, ministers were accused of improperly whipping up the judges into a frenzy of harsh sentencing. Lord Macdonald, Queen's Counsel, a distinguished lawyer and former DPP, was moved to comment that the courts risked being swept up in a collective loss of proportion. Judges were complimented by Number 10 on their tough sentences and accused by others of thereby doing Number 10's bidding. It is unusual for the judiciary of England and Wales to be criticised for passing harsh sentences. The most vocal criticism is usually reserved for sentences seen as unduly lenient. Reporting here too can often contain emotive and intemperate language. Despite the fact there is in place a well-regulated regime for referring unduly lenient sentences to the Court of Appeal, 
A press campaign was launched to name and shame those judges whom they accused of being soft on crime. The campaign involved daily features on particular judges, complete with photographs of the judges, and on occasions representatives of the press would lie in wait outside the judges' private homes to doorstep them and to doorstep members of their families. Another way of undermining judicial independence is not to bother with criticism or threats, but simply to ignore judicial decisions. As Newt Gingrich has declared he would do if elected President of the United States and the US Supreme Court decided cases against him. Why not? The judiciary is the weakest branch of the state. It has, as Alexander Hamilton put it, neither sword nor purse. The answer to that question can also be drawn from the United States. Mr Gingrich was not the first to think he could ignore the Supreme Court. Now we are going back a long way. In 1832, the United States Supreme Court heard the case of Worcester and Georgia. It held a Georgia statute to be void on the grounds it was in violation of federal law. It issued an order requiring Georgia to release from detention one Samuel Worcester. Georgia refused. President Andrew Jackson also refused to take any action to enforce the ruling. He expressed the view it was a matter for the states and he had no power to intervene. South Carolina took President Jackson at his word and passed a statute which made it clear it viewed federal law as an optional extra. If the president can pick and choose which laws to be followed, why not the state of South Carolina? By refusing to enforce the Supreme Court's judgment, the president had sent a clear message that federal law did not apply to all. By failing to uphold the court's decision, he undermined the rule of law. Unsurprisingly, he rapidly took steps to undo the damage caused by his initial decision. The lesson to our politicians is clear. If the executive were to choose to carry through a threat, a threat to the judiciary by simply refusing Gingrich-like or Jackson-like to implement a court judgment, that would be the end for the rule of law. If the executive chose to undermine the independence of the judiciary by ignoring judgments, why should anyone else abide by them? Why should anyone pay their taxes? Threats have consequences. A threat to the independence of the judiciary, if carried through, is a threat not simply to the judges. It is a threat to the executive, to the authority of parliament, and to the electorate. The final example I wish to give of potential threats is the group of often unidentified people who use the internet to defy and threaten judges. I confess to a love of the internet. It has revolutionized my life. However, there is a downside. Some do abuse it. To date, we have seen two women jailed for disobeying a judge's directions not to use the internet, thereby prejudicing the course of justice in criminal trials. We have seen the Crusaders, who believe that whatever they do to further their cause is justified. For example, the animal rights activists, who in an attempt to intimidate me, put my personal details, the details of my husband, the details of my young children, the details of my widowed mother, the details of my widowed mother-in-law, and the details of a farmer in Kent who had nothing to do with me, <laughs> on the internet, under the banner, their homes are not bombproof. These are the activists, that there are also, of course, the activists who object to the principle of so-called super injunctions, they will deliberately flout court rulings not to identify a claimant. There are members of parliament who feel entitled to join in the sport using the cloak of parliamentary privilege. There are then the representatives of the press who of course feel that if it's been mentioned in parliament they can join in too and they can report the proceedings. Finally, there is a category of person who uses the internet because they quite simply like baiting judges. These are people who, for no reason other than sport, indulge in court baiting. They publish for the sake of it material the court has ruled confidential. What do these examples have in common? By one means or another, 
The effect is to undermine individual judicial decisions and potentially to bring influence to bear upon the judiciary as a whole. Furthermore, they demonstrate that such threats can come from any direction, from the executive, from the press, from parliamentarians, the public, and from distinguished commentators. Thus is exposed the potential fragility of judicial independence. We cannot be complacent. Former US Supreme Court Associate Justice Sandra Day O'Connor explained, the experience of developing countries, former communist countries, and our own political culture teaches us that we must ever be vigilant against those who would strong arm the judiciary into adopting their preferred policies. Note her use of the phrase, our own political culture. Her concern was not limited to developing countries. I should not want to give the impression that judges are delicate flowers who expect to be able to pass judgment without criticism of any kind. Judges understand and accept the importance of freedom of expression and a free press. We expect robust, robust criticism of our decisions from whatever quarter. Sadly, judges are growing accustomed to unpleasant personal attacks. We are meant to be sufficiently hardy to take the criticism on the chin, shrug it off and carry on doing our job. I have no doubt that our current generation of judges will continue to do just that. However, judges are only human. If in the future, the press and politicians and other commentators continue to cross the line more and more frequently and more and more dramatically, what effect will the drip, drip, drip of public criticism have? The press and all members of the public may not realise the effect a constant barrage of ill-informed personal attacks can have upon a judge and his family. Might the barrage one day go further and have an effect on a professional level? Might it influence the outcome of a case? Might it prevent the judge from taking the brave but just decision? We all think not and hope not. We must be given sufficient resources to train and support our judges to cope with the inevitable glare of the limelight to ensure that it does not. In the meantime, we need constantly to remind those in positions of influence how precious our judicial system is to our constitution, our democracy and our reputation abroad. Who will do the reminding? Where are the guardians of judicial independence ever ready to support the institution and ward off attack? Judges, obviously. Academics, obviously. Politicians and members of the executive, one would hope. Until recently, we had the Lord Chancellor as top judge and member of the cabinet and well placed to fulfill this role. Since the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, although no longer top judge, he retains what is now a statutory duty to act as guardian of the judiciary's independence. Successive Lord Chancellors have taken that duty seriously, albeit one or two may have needed nudging into action. But what happens if a non-lawyer, or even a lawyer, of a similar frame of mind to Newt Gingrich, who resents what he sees at the court's intrusion into political life, takes office as Lord Chancellor? Will he or she be as ready or willing to step in and act appropriately as guardian of the Constitution? Will they be there to explain to the various committees of the Houses of Parliament the ex legitimate extent to which they may demand answers of judges? Is it a coincidence that the demise of the Lord Chancellor as top judge has coincided with a huge and exponential rise in the requests of parliamentary committees for judges to attend before them? For the most part, judges are, of course, happy to assist, anxious to dispel the myths of the ivory tower and to help where we can. Judges have responded willingly on matters within their expertise. However, there are dangers. Judges cannot, on the one hand, demand respect for their individual and institutional independence, and on the other hand, appear to descend into the political arena. Indeed, they should be wary of entering any contentious public arena on a less than a judicial level. A number of colleagues have written and spoken on the subject 
and I wish I had time to cite them all. Mr Justice Beetson has written eruditely, as one would expect, on the dangers of judges becoming involved in public inquiries. Mine was an inquest. <laughs> Blurring the edge which marks the sharp definitions of the functions of the judiciary on the one hand and the executive and legislature on the other. Another colleague, in an excellent lecture which I commend to you, entitled The Mask of the Judge, Lord Justice Moses, agreed arguing that one of the essential arguments against the use of judges on inquiries is that it undermines the authority of the judge, although the government and executive take advantage of that authority to cloak the inquiry with respectability. The conclusions do not have the authority of a judge. If the conclusions are undermined, so is that authority. He foresaw the dangers in letting what he called the mask of the judge slip. He said this, Authority to give a decision lies in the very fact that the judges are unelected and do not account for their decisions, save in the reasoning they provide within their judgments. If there's a problem to be solved which has no correct solution, whether a baby should be allowed to die, whether evidence vital to protect life should be obtained through torture, whether detention may be in the interests of public safety, the only th thing democracy requires is an answer recognised as authoritative. That requires the recognition of the authority of a judicial decision, and that requires a mask. As you know, he recently delivered a typically thought-provoking and forthright lecture attacking the proposed system of quality assurance for advocates. It is a highly controversial topic. Does that mean he fell into the trap about which he so eloquently warned us? Did his mask slip? In my view, it did not. I do not intend to comment one way or the other on the merits or otherwise of the quality assurance scheme and the dangers he foresaw. I come, therefore, not to bury this particular Caesar, nor to praise him. But I do come to support his right to speak out on an issue of such fundamental importance to the system of the justice in this country, namely the independence of the legal profession. There are threats to the independence of the legal profession, about which I too shall be speaking in another lecture shortly, and they must be taken seriously. An independent judiciary is dependent upon an independent legal profession. The rule of law cannot survive without both. It is not, in my view, descending into the arena of politics or policy to speak on independence. However, to avoid the risk of the mask slipping, judges must be cautious in their choice of topics, venues, and of accepting every invitation to speak. Most importantly, boundaries must be observed by those who put the judge in the public arena and ask them to speak or answer questions. Unfortunately, and perhaps understandably it not being their world, politicians focused on their own quest may not always be aware that boundaries exist, let alone where they lay. The Constitution requires a recognition of those boundaries. There must be someone who accepts responsibility, someone prepared to warn and or reprimand those who overstep the mark. Someone who understands, as Lord Faulkner said that he did, and I'm sure Ken Clark would too, how a politician should respond to decisions of the courts that they dislike. If the law develops in a way which is unacceptable to the public, the answer is not to launch personal attacks upon the judges or seek their dismissal from office. It's for Parliament to change the law. Lord Faulkner told the House of Lords Constitutional Committee as follows. If you disagree with a decision, say what you're going to do. If you're going to appeal, say you will appeal. If you're going to change the law, say you'll change the law. If you cannot appeal and cannot change the law, then my advice would be to keep quiet, because there's not much you can do about it. <laughs> it's a pretty unwise thing for a minister to say there's something wrong with the law, but we're not going to do anything about it. What is objectionable is something which expressly or impliedly says that there's something wrong with these judges for reaching this conclusion. Lord Faulkner, dare I say it, seems to have understood the post-1689 constitutional settlement in a way that Bentham did not. 
That brings me to the question shortly of resources. Here I am at risk of entering the political or policy arena, so I shall tread warily. As I've said, an independent judiciary can only function effectively when supported by an independent legal profession. Yet we are living in hard times, and difficult choices have to be made on how to spend precious resources. I speak from the luxurious position who one of one who does not have to make those choices. I shall say only this, therefore. The legal system may not always tug at our heartstrings in the way that the NHS and the education of small children may do, but it is nonetheless vital. It is essential to a healthy democracy and the rule of law. I hope that whatever resources are allocated to funding litigation and whatever means are deployed, they are sufficient to ensure proper access to justice to those who need it without undermining the ethos of the legal profession. Similarly, I hope that whatever resources are allocated to the courts and tribunal service are sufficient to allow judges to do their job. Penny Derbyshire, an academic, spent seven years researching and work shadowing judges of every level. She was given unprecedented access to our rooms and to our discussions. She's recently published a book entitled Sitting in Judgment, The Working Lives of Judges. The judges are referred to by their initials, and no, I am not going to reveal which are mine. Sorry, by initials, not their initials, by initials. <laughs> <laughs> Under the heading Resources and the Threat to Independence, she said this, Spending money on justice does not attract votes. The courts are out of sight and out of mind. Many judges work in straitened circumstances. Buildings are badly designed or crumbling. Lodges are, lodgings are shabby. IT systems uncoordinated and decades behind the outside world with a lack of support. Judges do not complain of their own conditions because they know their staff are paid a pittance and public agencies underfunded. Conditions can only get worse. She continued with an explanation of the nature and significance of the cuts required in ministry spending. The problem is the same the world over. I was approached last summer by legislators in Hong Kong asking me if everyone else has to cut back, cut back, why not the courts and the judges? Why should they be immune? I do not suggest that they should be. And I understand that in such straitened times, talk of judicial independence may cut little ice with vast swathes of the public and the press. But resources, or rather the lack of them, is a potential threat and cannot be ignored. The same could be said about judicial training. I repeat the same health warning. It's not for me to dictate the allocation of precious resources. However, I've already spoken of the importance of training our judges, not just in judgecraft, black letter law, and the social context of their judging, but also in how to withstand outbursts of public disapprobation. Two professors, my favorite professors, who probably know more about the judges of this country than the judges themselves, have spoken on the subject of the importance of training to judicial independence. If they will forgive me, therefore, I shall quote from them. Professor Dame Hazel Genn of this university has asked and answered the question of why do we need judicial training in this way. Legislation and common law are together fundamental to economic and social stability and the achievement of social justice. The judiciary are responsible for interpreting legislation and regulations, for applying and developing the settled legal principles of the common law, for imposing penalties on offenders and providing remedies for injustice. Judicial decisions are highly significant for individuals and for the wider society. The daily decisions of the judiciary have a fundamental impact on the liberty, livelihood and reputation of citizens. They have a critical role in making effective legal provisions designed to improve social justice, protect the weak and vulnerable, enforce responsibilities and maintain social order. The integrity and legitimacy of the legal system depend on the judiciary at all levels having the necessary degree of knowledge and skill to deliver accurate legal decisions by processes that are demonstrably fair and perceived to be so by victims, offenders, litigants, witnesses, the legal profession and the public at large. 
the role of judges in courts and tribunals requires additional knowledge and skills of a type and level that are not acquired in the course of a professional legal career, let alone any other career. Her colleague here at UCL, Professor Cheryl Thomas, the holder of the first chair in judicial studies in the United Kingdom, agrees. In a report on judicial training across Europe, she said this, Judicial independence encompasses both the real and perceived lack of political interference in judges' neutral interpretation of the law and the ability of judges to make unpopular decisions that are right in law. Challenges to judicial independence, often in the guise of political proposals to reform the judiciary and legal process, can grow out of concerns over the ability of the judiciary to meet the demands of a rapidly changing justice system. In order to preserve their independence, judges increasingly need to demonstrate a wide range of skills, some of which have traditionally not been covered by judicial training programmes. In the 21st century, the ability of judicial training and education programmes to adapt and enable judges to develop new skills in non-traditional areas is a key element in promoting judicial independence. I agree with both. As the head of the Judicial College, I would, wouldn't I? The job of judging has become increasingly complex and requires a number of skills which not all of us will have honed to perfection before joining the bench. A well-trained judiciary is more likely to command the confidence of the public, the press and commentators. A well-grounded and supported judge provides properly crafted and objective reasons for his or her decisions is less likely to be the subject of ill-informed criticism, although sadly there is no guarantee as some of my colleagues can testify. So far the College has been able to accommodate the cuts in our budget required without making too drastic a reduction to our programme and without feeling we have been treated unduly harshly. I emphasise so far. I turn finally to judicial appointments. I do so for the sake of balance and for fear otherwise of sounding like a Bentham-esque conspiracy theorist. Here we have an example of a government, the executive, giving up the power to appoint judges, an important constitutional power, and they have handed the power to an independent commission. In my view, they are to be commended. I have commented publicly more than once on the fact that I am a total convert to the new system and I now speak on the subject with the zealotry of the convert. An independent commission appointing judges can only support and enhance the independence of the judiciary. However, the system as established under the CRA is not perfect. It requires some reform. Many of us here have given evidence to the House of Lords Constitutional Committee all written on the subject. My comments focus principally upon the fact that the Act allows for the significant involvement by the Executive in the appointments process, should the Lord Chancellor choose to use his powers. This has led some to question whether there should be any political involvement in the process. Others, given what they perceive as excessive judicial activism, have raised the prospect of greater polit political involvement, to my mind ignoring the lessons from across the Atlantic. As you know, under the present system, once the Lord Chancellor receives a recommendation from the Judicial Appointments Commission, he may accept the selection, reject it, or require the JAC or the panel to reconsider. He may only reject on the basis that the person is not suitable. He may ask for reconsideration only on the basis there's not enough evidence that the person is suitable for the office, or there's evidence that the person is not the best candidate on merit. He must give reasons in writing. What if, as some would prefer, the JC was obliged to provide a list of names from which the Lord Chancellor of the day may select his or her favoured candidate, rather than, as at present, the JC is recommending one candidate for one post? Would a minister be tempted, however subconsciously, to prefer the candidate who has not sat regularly in the administrative court and been a thorn in the flesh of the government? On the other side of the coin, would our judge of the future, keen on promotion and forever in the firing line of the administrative court, be tempted, even unconsciously, to sway with the political wind, knowing the way in which it was all too clearly blowing? 
Former US Court of Appeals Justice Guido Calabresi concluded, somewhat unfairly in my view, that the greatest threats to judicial independence were judges with ambition. The suggestion was, in effect, that a judge like Cassius, with a lean and hungry looks, and I ever on promotion, might weigh their decisions carefully and play to the gallery, rather than keeping their eye firmly and solely on the legal and factual merits. Historically, there's been little scope for Cassius-like behaviour amongst judges in this country. We haven't had a career judiciary. To a degree, that is likely to change. Promotion is becoming more common. The idea of a career judiciary as a means to secure greater diversity amongst the judiciary formed part of the Neuberger Report's recommendations. Some fear that such a necessary, and I emphasise I do consider it a necessary reform, carries with it a possible danger in that it might create the climate for Cassius to flourish. However, to my mind, that is a significant risk only if the appointment and the promotion of judges are in the hands of those who might take exception to a particular decision. The risk decreased virtually to non-existence if the appointments are in the hands of an independent commission. As far as any involvement of Parliament itself in the selection of judges is concerned, I question what purpose would be served. What questions could parliamentarians properly ask? <coughs> could they ask the candidate for their political views? Could they ask the candidate for their views on religion, the European Court of Human Rights, abortion, euthanasia? If so, on what basis? Surely a judge's personal beliefs are irrelevant to the job they have to do. I remember an American colleague whom I was told would make an admirable candidate for appointment to the United States Supreme Court. When I questioned her as to her chances, she said nil. I asked why. She replied, because I've been a serving judge for too long. There are too many of my decisions out there to be picked over by the politicians. The idea of too much experience as a judge disqualifying one from highest judicial office was a novel one to me. Thus, there are a number of ways in which external influences can be brought to bear upon the judiciary, not necessarily deliberately, but nonetheless effectively. There are a number of ways in which judges themselves can undermine judicial independence. The most obvious would be taking a bribe. A bribe. But as one of the few examples I can find in our history goes back to the days of Francis Bacon, who retired what he called a broken reed. He must have been a broken rich reed, having confessed to 23 acts of taking bribes from litigants. Uh, given there are so few examples, I shall move swiftly on. Less obvious than bribery or corruption of that kind, a judge can compromise their decisional independence through having an actual or perceived interest in the litigation, as was explored in Ex Party Pinochet or Lockerbell UK Limited and Bayfield. However, cases of actual interest are also exceedingly rare and cases of perceived interest unusual in our jurisdiction. Another way in which independence could be compromised would be for a judge or judges to decide cases on political rather than legal grounds. This was what happened, of course, in the Court of Star Chamber. But we no longer have such a court. One might have thought, therefore, the prospect of judges entering into the arena of political decision-making had also long gone in developed democracies. However, I must again cross the Atlantic we all remember the unedifying spectacle of Bush and Gore in 2000, when respected justices of the Supreme Court were accused of deciding the case on party political lines. Most commentators agreed that had they done so, they were unfit for office. Yet Mark Tushnet, a constitutional scholar of Harvard University, has said that if he were a judge, he would decide a close constitutional case by making an explicitly political judgment. He would take whatever decision advance the cause of socialism. Not surprisingly, that view has been roundly criticised. Judges must take care not to decide cases in order to further their own political beliefs, or for that matter, their own personal beliefs or interests. They must not seek the approbation of editorials, public or political plaudits. A judge who plays to the gallery either through their judgments, through articles, or even lectures such as this one in pursuit of praise would be one who has placed their own self-interest 
ahead of justice. That is not to say that a judge should not, where necessary, take a stand. As Justice Edwin Cameron of South Africa has said, this is a vital ingredient of judicial independence. Being willing to take a stand to see equal justice before the law is, be, is done to all, no matter who they are, what they have done or are said to have done, calls for judges to set aside self-interest. It requires, as both Lord Judge, Chief Justice and Lord Clerk, former Master of the Royals have put it, moral courage. I started tonight's lecture by noting how Bentham was not a fan of judges, that he thought their independence enabled them to do as they pleased. No judge does as they please. Any who did would not remain a judge for long. They do not and would not because of the strength of their commitment to the independence of the judiciary. The proper interpretation of just law and its application to true facts is the sole means by which justice can be achieved. An independent and properly accountable judiciary is the means by which the promises of democracy are rendered effective. We must hold fast to that truth as we have since the Act of Settlement. If we do not, and threats to judicial independence cease to be the rare slips which they have been, we undermine not just the judiciary, but more crucially, we undermine our commitment to the rule of law and democracy. I conclude with some remarks from Lord Judge. At the 16th Commonwealth Law Conference in Hong Kong in April 2009, because I cannot put it any better, in a democratic country, all power, however exercised in the community, must be founded on the rule of law. Therefore, each and every exercise of political power must be accountable, not only to the electorate at the ballot box when elections take place, but also at all times to the rule of law. Independent professions protect it. Independent press and media protect it. Ultimately, however, it is the judges who are the guardians of the rule of law. That is their prime responsibility. They have a particular responsibility to protect the constitutional rights of each citizen, as well as the integrity of the constitution by which those rights exist. The judge, therefore, cannot be out for popularity. He or she cannot please everyone. He should never try to please everyone. That includes the judge himself. He should never use his office to confirm his predilections or to allow his prejudices to gain some kind of spurious judicial respectability. However, because he is not accountable to the electorate, as members of the legislative are, it is entitled, he is entitled to apply the relevant law, but only the relevant law. And although he must be aware of his powers, it is critical to the independent exercise of his responsibilities that he should fully recognise the limitations of his power. Having been entrusted with huge power, judges have an ultimate responsibility to see that when exercising the power vested in them, they use it lawfully in precisely the same way as they ensure that political and other powers vested in other institutions of the state are exercised lawfully. Without independence and without respect for judicial independence, these desirable, indeed elementary facets of a civilised society are threatened. At the same time, no individual or group of individuals, not even any judge, however high his office, has any dispensing power, that is, the power to set aside or disregard the law. Thank you.